Hay un montón de animales, pero la verdad es que sería que nunca se me considera una hora. Yo cuando tengo en propia casa, yo, estoy segura, sí. yo quiero un perro lobo. Yo sé que soy un tiempo. O sea, es combinación. Yo duermo con mi titi, la abuelo, la nena de mal. Yo duermo abrazando a mi mamá. No, 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 es la semana educativa. Pero están haciendo algo para el día de fin. No, 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 Okay, so good morning, everyone. So today, um, as you know, I've postponed what would have been the seminar uh, lecture to focus on um, this topic, which we look at the use of metal complexes for the detection of disease. We will resume the seminars next Tuesday. I also want to give you another announcement that on Thursday, we're not going to have class. The reason for that is I'm going to pick up our guest speaker um, on Thursday during class time. So I've asked Javier and I also asked Carmen if it's okay that we present the following Tuesday. Okay, so we'll have class Tuesday. We won't have class Thursday. We'll have class Friday for the, the rice um, speak, and then we'll, we'll follow the schedule along. All right, but I will talk to those who were supposed to present Tuesday, how we're going to um, manage this long. All right, so our discussion now will center on thinking about metal complexes as they can be used for the detection of disease. All right, so the majority of our discussions have really focused on uh, metal complexes, metal ions in particular, in terms of their biological function, how they can impact physiology, and then those metals that are of a therapeutic property, how they exhibit their mechanisms of action in order to treat disease. So in this context, then, we have focused on what properties of metal complexes uh, generally are perceived to be important for a therapeutic application. So in this respect, then, they can express their biological activity by potentially losing one or more of the bound ligands. So from this perspective, then, you have a modified metal compound um, or even metal ion or free ligand that's serving as the active agent. So from um, looking at this, we have seen examples where a metal simply serves as a delivery agent or a ligand serves as a delivery agent or the actual metal complex is playing a role in terms of enabling of properties that may or may not be due to the intact compound itself. We've also looked at um, the reactions directly with target molecules and cells that help to impair the function of those target molecules, enabling a therapeutic effect. And we've also seen examples where by the use of an external stimuli, we can actually transform metal complexes into active agents. But these particular properties are not necessarily desirable when we're thinking about compounds that are for a potential diagnostic purpose. All right, so you want that these compounds have very minimal reactivity. So what kind of reactivity are we talking about? Well, we're talking about this idea of an exchange of ligands. So that whole idea of ligand lability, we don't want to see that when the, when the specific purpose is for diagnosis. So in this regards, we can um, look at the, the application of metal compounds in two areas. One is in nu nuclear medicine. So here we're talking about radioactive metal complexes where the reactivity is coming from the metal. And also um, looking at the use of metals as contrast agents in magnetic resonance imaging, um, abbreviated as MRI. And here we're talking about things that are non-radioactive um, and we're going to look at what properties of the metals is enabling this effect in, um, in MRI. All right, so let's briefly talk about uh, nuclear medicine. And we already have had an introduction of this. As you recall, Dr. Esther Boros talked about the use of 
of, of radioactivity as a way to, as in, for an antibacterial application, we should also have used this technology for anti-cancer um, applications. And so essentially here, what we're referring to is a patient is going to get some dosage of a radioactive metal compound, and then you need some um, detector, a camera that's gonna capture an image, and that image is going to be of the radiation that your body is letting off. This radiation coming from the, um, the radioactive properties of the metal itself. So the metal breaking down into particles that that can be perceived. So the detection technique will depend on the nature of the radioisotope pertaining to the particular element of interest, metal of interest. So one type of um, technique is single photon emission computed tomography, referred to as SPECT. And so this is mainly used for imaging radioactive technetium, so 99M technetium compounds. So here is a perspective of the use of one type of technetium compound in order to um, detect a, a tumor. So what we're looking at here is the complexation of technetium. So we see the technetium coordinated here. And what's um, so we have the coordination component, but we also have another element here where there is a, um, a moiety that's actually going to be specific for a receptor that is overexpressed here in this particular application in, in brain. And so what we're looking at in this image is the imaging of a brain and where there is um, a particular type of cancer. So we're looking at glioma and how this particular compound via the use of the technetium for the, the radioactivity, but also using this targeting group, as we discussed last time, is an important feature. So we're looking at what is actually being imaged. So here we, we're focusing on the prostate-specific membrane antigen protein that tends to be overexpressed in certain gliomas. So um, this is abbreviated as PSMA. So this moiety over here gets recognized by that particular protein. So it's highly expressed in the proliferating microvasculature of high-grade gliomas, so um, HGG, and also gray metastasis. And so this particular compound, which is technetium EDDA, that's the chelator, and then you have the part, the INIC IPSMA, which is what's recognized by the, um, the, the protein. So it was evaluated for a spec brain imaging application as a specific diagnosis of HGG and also brain metastasis. So what are we looking at here? So we're looking at um, the, the classification of grade two, classification of grade three and grade four. So those are the higher grade levels of this glioma. And what we can see here that we're actually able to image the grade three and the grade four, although we don't see any indication really of the grade two. So again, this is more specific for a higher grade version of this. And we're also able to detect um, here where there's been metastasis that has occurred. So that just kind of shows us how we can, how this particular compound is being used as a tool to be able to detect these um, these tumors. So another type of um, nuclear um, approach is positron emission tomography, which is what um, Professor Boris um, discussed with you. So abbreviated as PET, it's employed to detect the radioisotopes of a number of metal ions, for instance, copper, gallium, rubidium. And one of its functions that can be used can be as a, as a way of tracking these metal ions to determine their, their distribution in the body. So as an example, um, here we're looking at a titanium compound. This is titanium saline dipig. And so Yolmari, who was, um, who was a, a member of this course, so she actually participated in a, in a study that we did last semester where we looked at titanium for anti-cancer applications. So if you have any interest, you can talk to her about some of the work that she did in, in that work. One of the components of this was looking at how um, titanium 45 PET can be used to understand the um, the potential function of a titanium anti-cancer compound. So this compound here, which consists of a saline ligand and a dipic ligand, so the saline component is here, we have that here, and then we have the dipic component here. So this is a, a heptadentate um, coordinate complex, okay, which is a little unusual for titanium as it prefers to have more along the lines of a coordination number six um, octahedral geometry. Well, this particular compound actually demonstrates really broad spectrum anti-cancer effect. And so in a study, they wanted to understand, given its promising activity against um, different cell lines, how it may show an effect within an animal model. 
So the idea was to try to create the titanium 45 version of this particular compound. And so basically here is a schematic, and this is just a cartoon representation of how you can generate titanium 45 by using a uh, scandium foil. And basically what is the, um, the energy that you need in order to generate this radioisotope? So 45 titanium. All right, so essentially then they created the titanium 45 version of this compound. So important things that we need to know, especially as the potential utility of this technique. So titanium-45 um, positron-emitting um, radioisotope has a half-life of 3.1 hours, and that's going to be important um, as we're looking at the, the use of this material. So half-life 3.1 hours means like the degradation of that, um, that reactive species. The nuclear characteristics, um, you have 85% degrade. Okay, so these... Uh, it's the particle that forms and the associated energy from this. So that's going to be an important feature in terms of properties of the titanium-45 that needs to be assessed. And so what we're looking at here then is the tracking of the titanium. As it's going through this particular animal model, so this is a um, NMRI nude mice um, that was implanted these HT29 xenograft tumors. Okay, so that was put into the mice. And so the objective was to understand one, does it have the capacity to um, be potent and, and actually re result in the shrinkage of that tumor? And how does it bind distribute to the body? Do we see an accumulation in the actual side of the tumor? So as you can see, we're looking at this over time. So one minute, we're looking at the radiation associated with the titanium. 10 minutes later, 30 minutes, three hours, seven hours. And so those arrows may not be as clear um, to you because they're pretty small. Those are different sites at, at um, a particular organ. So the red arrow here is, is corresponds to the heart, but also the circulatory system, as this was actually an, an IV, an intravenous injection of this compound. Then that orange um, arrow here is the, um, the liver. So it's kind of weird how close they approximate these two organs are, but supposedly that's where it's located. Then we're looking at here, the gallbladder, and then the pink is the cecum area, and then the green is the colon area. Okay, so um, the actual tumor is in this vicinity right here. Okay, so keep our, our attention where the tumor is. And so we're looking at this range, so the signal over here, as an indicator of that radiation that's being um, that we're perceiving from the titanium. And so red indicates. Uh, a significant concentration of that particular element. And then obviously as you get into the black is a very low amount. And so as we can see over time, you're just looking at the flow as it wasn't in, um, injected intravenously through the circulatory system, through the, through the, 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 the body of this particular animal. Um, and so what we see is that we get it um, basically never really localizing significantly at all at the side of the tumor, maybe in this, superficially, like outside of it, but not really a significant amount. And you get at the end, a lot of it being cleared from uh, through the colon. So in other words, the actual in vivo application of this compound was not as um, as as expected, given the promising results in the in vitro application with, of this compound against that particular um, uh, cancer cell line. So not much accumulation of the titanium, and you see a relatively rapid um, clearance of this compound is going through the circulatory system, but ultimately released through the, um, um, through the colon, so the feces. All right, go ahead. So is there any reason why they use salad, thermal salad? Right, so for titanium compounds, the salad complexes tend to be more, um, more stable, but in terms of the ligand exchange, really less ligand exchange um, inert for that for that context. Which for titanium, um, you want a balance. So there are certain titanium compounds where you want to keep it as an intact compound as it enters into the cellular environment, and then it, it exhibits effect. For the titanium saline complexes, those are a little bit more ligand exchange. Um, uh, I would say more ligand exchange labile, and so. Before, like I would say, the generation before this particular compound, you would have just titanium salin, and then you would have like either ethanol molecules or you would have some other solvent molecules that are satisfying coordination. 
those are less stable. So this particular variation of the saline compound incorporated that uh, tridentate ligand and the dipate ligand. And so the idea was that you want to enhance its stability without taking away its potential anti-cancer uh, property. So some of that context that I obviously I didn't describe. So this particular compound, uh, it, had, it didn't exhibit everything that they wanted enhance uh, stability, um, also still maintain its broad spectrum effect. So the idea was, okay, if, if we improve the um, the potential of that compound, at least at the level of cells, do we see it at the level of in vivo? And so in vivo, it obviously was not something that was um, very promising at all. So, yeah. so probably also silent uh, might hypnolize. Mm -hmm. So it would be ideal Right, so I think uh, my understanding is that this compound, at least within this time frame, is supposed to be pretty stable to hydrolysis. Oh. Whereas the the saline ones, the saline ones are basically, you know, they're not as stable, so they they're more prone to hydrolysis. But nonetheless, I don't think um, I would have to look at the literature. I don't know if there's a saline version of this type of titanium with a tridentate ligand um, serving as this heteroleptic compound. I would have to look at that. Yeah. All right, so what are the limitations of this type of report? Well, obviously, the radioactivity that's associated with the, uh, the, the metal, although as Professor Boros mentioned to you, this is not as, at least with the titanium, is not as scary as you know, people um, have made it out to be. But also, uh, very importantly, is how you're intending to use this technique. So in this context, if you're intending to use it so that you can perceive a compound and how it distributes to the body, you want a certain amount of of time for that radioactive species to exist. It can't um, degrade very quickly, right? So ours seems like it's fast relative to our perception, but in terms of certain applications, ours is actually pretty slow, right? So in that regard, then the short lifetime of the radioactive metal ions really requires then that as soon as you generate the titanium in this context or the, the radioactive metal, that you need to quickly be able to synthesize a compound of it. So you have, the, the short half, the last time of the radioactive metal, and then you have to do the chelation um, chemistry. And then you have to ensure that your route of chelating that metal will not result in intermediates or too much of the free ligand because those impurities can affect what you're trying to do. So that's a fact that you need to consider is how quickly you're able to use that radioactive metal in terms of the application that you're trying to do. All right. So here we're going to switch then to the use of metal compounds as contrast agents for MRI. So here I'm going to give you a little bit of an MRI 101 just to give us a perspective of what exactly is this technique. And so we have to draw back to um, really understanding NMR, which um, Oscar went to a seminar yesterday and of course he can probably give this lecture right now since he, he's more familiar than I am. So MRI 101. So what the basis of this is that you're um, it's basically doing a diagnostic imaging with, um, with this particular technique. And it's directly connected to the theory of NMR. So a conventional NMR um, spectroscopy experiment really involves the, the study of the chemical shifts of protons as a means of characterizing the structure of the molecules in the solution. And I'm emphasizing protons, and I know obviously there are other NMR active nuclei, but in this context, we, with respect to MRI, we're focusing on protons. That's, that's the um, what we're essentially are, are really interested in. So for NMR, um, in the traditional sense, you're just looking at the chemical shifts as it's associated with the functional groups within your molecule, and that can tell you a structural insight. Now, with MRI then, you're focusing on the relaxation properties of the protons as they come from water molecules. So within our body, we're really looking at water molecules that we're, we're, fo we're focusing on and how the relaxation of those protons in the water molecules are affected by the tissue within the body. All right, so here, um, just to remind us back to general chemistry, you're looking at the spin um, associated with protons. So protons have a nuclear spin quantum number, and this is associated with the, uh, the reality that protons can spin on their axis. And as a consequence of the spinning motion, you're able to generate magnetic fields. So this is a depiction of that spinning process, right? As you're spinning around, but then you're generating these magnetic fields. But the reality is that this spinning orientation is not something that's directed. It was, it's going to go in many different orientations. And as a consequence of that, you're going to have no net magnetization that's coming from this particular spin. So the unpaired spin generates a nuclear magnetic moment um, that is perpendicular to its spin. 
Okay, but because of the orientation of this particular um, spin, you're not going to get any net magnetization. Okay, but what we're going to look at is what happens to this in the presence of an external magnetic field. That's the premise of um, NMR. So the nuclear spin angular momentum quantum number, MI, can be either plus or minus one half. So we're well aware of this. So it turns out that in the absence of an external magnetic field, they are degenerate. So here's terminology from the beginning of the course. What does that mean? That means that these spin, these orientations are equal in energy. And so what happens is that this degeneracy is actually lost when you apply an external magnetic field. All right, so let's look at this. So one orientation is the orientation of mi plus one half. And so as it turns out, once you apply an external magnetic field, this orientation is what's going to be stabilized. Okay, so it's actually going to go be the lower one in energy. And it becomes aligned with the applied field. But then the other orientation, which is the mi of negative one half, well, that one is actually going to be destabilized. So in other words, it goes higher in energy. And so this one is going to be the one that's going to be opposed to the applied field. So that's this is the reality of what happens when you start to apply this external magnetic field. So this is a perspective. We are starting here at this point. So you have the spin up, the spin down. So with respect to energy, so that's what this is showing us here. They're equal in energy. They are degenerate. Okay, but then we apply an external magnetic field, right? So we're gonna have our field that we're applying and the how, how big that field is, we start to see that difference in energy where we have the MI plus one half will be the stable one, lower in energy, and the MI negative one half will be the destabilized one, higher in energy. All right, so from um, this, then this technique, we're, assess we're basically assessing this energy difference between the stabilized spin versus the destabilized spin. All right, so this is associated with certain parameters and this define what are these parameters. So then here we have what is the magneto um, gyric ratio, and this is in units of radiance. Then you have the uh, Planck's constant. So here Planck divided by two pi, and then H, which is the strength of the applied magnetic field in units of Tesla. All right, so here then, we're gonna focus on the spin splitting that occurs because of the presence of the external magnetic field. And when I say spin splitting, it literally is the separation of energy of a stable versus a destabilized spin. So the strength of the magnetic field used in MRI um, typically can be one test over that, that will vary, and you'll see uh, some uh, ex examples later on. So it's an order of magnitude weaker than most magnetic fields used for NMR. For a proton in a magnetic field of one tesla, the value of delta E, that separation, is of 10 um, to the negative three per centimeters. So this corresponds to the electromagnetic radiation, and that appears in the radio frequency range. So that's something that I mentioned to you earlier in the course when we were looking at different techniques where this energy is associated with. All right, so here we're going to focus on the reality of how we take advantage of NMR. So this is referring to the Boltzmann's distribution of the nuclear spin moment. So what does that mean? Well, it basically means the population of the spin in either the down or the up position. Okay. So at temperatures at which most NMR or MRI measurements are made, there is enough thermal energy. Okay, so we're talking about this, this energy over two. So that both spin levels are almost, uh, the emphasis is almost equally populated. Okay, so it turns out that there's a slight excess of nuclei in the lower um, um, spin, so the, uh, the plus one half. So then when you look at the Boltzmann distribution equation in terms of perceiving how much of the population is plus one half, how much of the population is negative one half, you see that, that the ratio between the two is 0.999 goes on, so it's not one. One would imply equals distribution, but 0.9 means there's a slight excess in the plus one half. Okay, so that's a significant result. So NMR spectroscopy takes advantage of a slight spin population difference so that what we're perceiving is the movement of the, of the slight excess spin down, excuse me, plus one half going as it's getting cited to the negative one half. That is what you perceive in the same thing. All right, so MRI. So essentially here, you're gonna irradiate the sample while it is in the magnetic field with electromagnetic radiation that exactly corresponds to delta E. So once you are able to achieve that energy, that is called a condition referred to as resonance. 
okay? So that means that you're equaling the energy of that separation between the spin plus one half to the spin minus one half. So you align a radio frequency RF um, field perpendicular to the main magnetic field, which results in a promotion of the nuclei in the lower state to the upper state. If the um, radio frequency field remains on for a period of time, the population in the two states will become equal. So you're basically trying to achieve then a system that's at equilibrium where you have them in equal population, both the plus one half and the minus one half. After the RF field is turned off, the population of nuclei spins begins to immediately relapse. So what do I mean by relapse? I'm talking about those that have been transitioned to the higher energy state will come down to that lower energy state. That's the relaxation process to the original equilibrium distribution. And so the rate is characterized by a rate constant K. So you're looking at how fast is that relaxation from high, the high energy spin to the lower. All right, so essentially that. So that relaxation then, it emits an, a, a radiation that can be perceived. So because the transition from mi negative one half to plus one half emits radiation, the rate of relaxation can be directly monitored by detector receiver coil, which is sensitive to the RF radiation and is located at 90 degrees to both the magnetic and the RF fields. All right, so here's just a, a depiction of a patient that's going through an MRI instrument. So we look at the schematic diagram. So here we have a main magnetic field that's being put um, in this perspective here. And so then you get your um, you know, magnetic field being generated, and then you're applying the RF at, a, um, at an angle that's perpendicular to the main magnetic field. So then you're looking at then um, the, that radiation that's being emitted due to the relaxation, and you're picking them up um, by these, uh, this detector system. So data is collected as a function of time, can be used to measure the rate and also the half the lifetime of the relaxation process. All right, so this is maybe a little difficult for us to perceive right now, but essentially here we're looking at um, how this technique is working, where you have this population of the spin, whether up or down, and then you place the sample in that magnetic field, and then the magnetic field results in a um, decrease, uh, sorry, a excitation from low spin, uh, the low energy spin to the high energy spin. You apply the, um, the radio frequency, and then that tilts the, the direction of the magnetic field. And then you're also looking at then the relaxation that's occurring once you remove that energy from the higher energy state to the lower energy state. That's essentially what we're looking at here. So what are, what are those parameters that we're going to measure? So these are the relaxation parameters. So in a magnetic field, after the time t, the proton spins are aligned parallel to the magnetic field. At this time, the net magnetization vector lies along the direction of the applied field and is referred to as the equilibrium magnetization. The equilibrium magnetization is changed by exposing the nuclear spin system to energy of a frequency equal to the energy difference between the spin states. So this is mz equals to zero. The spin system can then be saturated. The time constant that describes how mz returns to its equilibrium state is called the longitudinal or spin lattice time, or as you might more commonly refer to it as the T1. So that's, that's that, that parameter that's there. All right, so then these are the associated um, uh, features that you, that you measure. Um, and then in, in what um, properties, uh, so the what values are typical for certain um, materials. So T1, and we're here we're looking at a time constant, one over K, the K being the rate constant. So K is the observed rate constant associated with the relaxation of the spin population at saturation to its thermal equilibrium. So T1 for liquids tends to be in the range of 10 to negative four to 10 seconds. And then T1 for solids is 10 to negative two to 10 to three seconds. So these values, um, these, uh, this time frame is going to be affected by fluctuation of neighboring molecules, but for our purpose, also by paramagnetic substances, right? And I say our purpose is because we're more from the metal focus and we know that a number of metals are paramagnetic. So that's where metals can play a role here. All right, but there's another parameter to keep in mind and that's the T2 parameter. So the T2 re relaxation is measured in the transverse plane which is parallel to the B1 field. So let's see where we are. So we're talk we were talking about 
up here for the first one. And then we're looking at this other field from due to the application of the RF. So that's where the T2 is coming from. All right, so T2 relaxation is measured in the transverse plane parallel to the B1 field used to tip the proton spins from the B0 field. For a spin tipping to take place, the RF pulse used to tip the spins into the transverse plane must be turned to, excuse me, to the Lamarck frequency of the proton spins. The proton spins are aligned in the direction of B1. After a short time, the spins begin to dephase, causing the spins to spread out in the T2 um, plane. And so we're basically looking at what's um, a, a related parameter that one focuses on is the T2 star, which is caused by the effects of inhomogeneities that occur in the applied field on T2. All right, so uh, what exactly is occurring in actual MRI? Like, what are we actually perceiving here? So in MRI, we're looking at the whole body being scanned, or at least the region being scanned, and we're looking at the, the relaxation of the different parts that are being assessed. So you're determining the relaxation parameters in three dimensions within the tissue of the patient. So this, um, excuse me, the spatial resolution of the relaxation parameters is carried out using three gradient magnets that are at right angle to one another. So I'm going to show you, I, I skipped that part when I was showing you the, the schematic. So I showed you that the main magnetic field is here, the radio frequency that's here, but those three gradient magnets are positioned here, at least from this perspective. And they're going, there are in these um, perpendicular orientation. So this is how you try to capture this sort of 3D um, image of, of the relaxation. So the spatial resolution of the relaxation parameter is carried out using three gradient magnets at right angle to one another. When turned on, produce linear field gradients in specific directions. The magnetic field changes along the gradient. Okay, so again, uh, I could have just gone to the next slide. We got that one too. All right, so here's just a representation of the output. So this is imagine that you've collected, uh, a, you scan uh, the head, and you want to focus on a part of the brain. So we're looking at this slice of a person's head. I mean, obviously, it's just not invasive thing, but you're looking at that portion of it. And so you're looking at that portion, so you're imaging that the brain there, but then you're focusing on little regions um, as, you know, as you're collecting this relaxation from the three dimensions. And essentially then, you produce that every little region is referred to as a voxel. And that voxel gets converted into a signal perceived as a pixel. And those pixel then gives you the actual image of whatever organ that you're trying to perceive within that, that volume of, uh, within that volume or that slice that you're focusing on. So what you're looking at then is that each little voxel will have its associated, you know, uh, three-dimensional measures of the relaxation. So that gets converted into a certain intensity of signal. So then the relaxation properties within many voxels are calculated. And after attaching a color, so it gets color coordinated, the intensity. You attach a color to a specific value of the relaxation parameter and you produce a 3D image. You have spatial resolution of about a few millimeters, right? So that's how you can produce the image that, you, that people will, will then focus on. All right. So now that essentially is what MRI is. Well, now what we're going to focus on is um, materials that are referred to as contrast agents and how they can modify this image that you obtain. So it is the contrast of the MRI image and its usefulness for diagnosis critically depend on the differences in water relaxation parameters between various regions and tissues. So protons from biomolecules, so biomolecules, we're talking about proteins and so forth, and other water molecules generate small fluctuating fields. So these are things that can, that can really um, have somewhat of an influence on the, on the relaxation of, of protons from water molecules. But uh, chemical compounds called contrast agents can dramatically affect the relaxation properties of the water molecule. If a contrast agent has access to a particular type of tissue, okay, so when I'm talking about particular type of tissue, let's say that you have a tumor, that's basically what we're, we're most times we're, we're focusing on, it will dramatically change the relaxation properties of water molecules that are located in that tissue, leading to greater differences in the relaxation properties between tissue with and without the contrast agent. So essentially, that contrast of the image is enhanced, and that's what you want to see, that, that difference as they can perceive that there might be a mass there. All right, so unpaired electrons produce approximately 660 times more potent local magnetic field than a proton. 
So therefore, contrast agents with super, so it's a, the emphasis on the, that, the, that paramagnetic feature, super paramagnetic species can dramatically alter the magnetic field of water protons. So for this reason, paramagnetic transition metal ions play an important role in this field. All right, so here we go back to fundamentals. We have our periodic table. And so one of the really important um, transition metals, one of the really important elements in this field is gadolinium. So gadolinium I have here in purple, okay? So Javier, what is the electron configuration of gadolinium? Uh, say, and? Oh, let's get the full thing. So we, we're, so we're here, but here is technically a key, right? So we're gonna start, I'm gonna help you out. We start with xenon, right? The shells. Okay, what's next? So one, two, two, three, four, five, six, six, right? Six, seven, six. Yeah, you went up further. <laughs> Take that, uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, After uh, Googling this, six, two, two, six, two, uh -huh. one, two, uh -huh. one, two, uh -huh. Then what's next? Nine. The, uh, well, nine. Okay, so you, you have a little bit of misconception because the very first one here is actually in the D shell. So there, that would be five, D, one. Okay, after that, then you start filling in the F shell. So oh. it'll be four F. Okay, so then just count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. Yeah, seven. I, I know. <laughs> No, I have left. <laughs> <laughs> Javier was brave enough to try this. Okay, there we go. Okay, so that's what we have. Okay, so that's that's uh, gadolinium, and then uh, the typical gadolinium will be gadolinium um, three plus, right? So Brenda, gadolinium three plus. What's going to be the electron configurations? Then my key gadolinium. Okay, so uh, that's a misconception. Okay, so you take from the valence orbitals. So at key, the valence orbitals will be the n um, that are highest. So the at the six and the five. Okay, so then you remove from the six s and the five d. So what you're going to be left with is four f seven. Okay, good. That's fine. That's why we're reviewing our fundamentals. Okay, so that's why we're here. All right, so small molecule gadolinium three contrast agents. So this is, I had all the answers here, but I just wanted to see <laughs> that you guys remember this. Okay, so we have F orbitals and we have seven electrons. That's what we're focusing on. And it turns out all those seven electrons are unpaired. So we have the super paramagnetic feature that we want to see. So an S equals, I should have asked that. What's the S value? So S equals seven and a half. All right, highly paramagnetic. All right, so there's a real little bit of coordination chemistry. So in this context, then gadolinium three plus tends to prefer a coordination number of nine. So that means it has to have nine orbitals available in order to satisfy this coordination number. And where are those orbitals coming from? Well, they're coming from the valence orbitals, which would be the, the S orbital, the three P orbitals that are available, and then the five D orbitals. You add them up, you have a total of nine orbitals. But in fact, when you're in that region of the periodic table, you can even go up to a coordination number of 15, right? Coordination number 15. So how is that possible? So we have nine, coordination nine with those orbitals. How do we get up to 15? Oscar, how do we get up to a coordination number 15? With what orbitals? Uh, how do we get up to an, a coordination number of 15? Potentially 15. How can we? Or even higher, like 15. There's nothing up there that's going to help you. There's nothing in that screen that's going to help you. So what, what's going to enable you to go higher coordination number is by using F orbitals. There's nothing there. So that's those F orbitals that are available, those can get you higher. But gadolinium tends to prefer, gadolinium 3 plus tends to prefer a coordination number of 9. All right, so why is that important? So that is important because the typical coordination number, as so I'm showing you here, um, so the typical coordination geometry is such like this that people try to take advantage of. So you can typically have a tricap trigonal prism or a monocapped square antiprism arrangement of ligands around the gadolinium. And so from this perspective, what we're seeing is that when you achieve that, 
you can, and that's why satisfy eight of the coordination sites, you typically want to use coordination compounds that have the ninth site available for coordination to water. So typically that, that ninth site is satisfied by water. All right, so why is that important? Because we're talking about a technique where you're trying to look at the relaxation properties of water itself. So here, what we're gonna look at is how that, that site that's available for water coordination, how that can potentially exchange with water molecules within the body. All right, so small molecule gadolinium um, contrast agents, due to the presence of one coordination site, gadolinium can bind water molecules with great ability. So here is the one exception to what I was saying to you before. We want compounds that are stable, but we also want an accessibility of coordination site to be able in this context to bind water because we're looking at a technique where we're looking at the relaxation of protons from water. And so that part is going to be very important. So the ninth site needs to be um, pretty much ligand exchange of um, labile. So direct exchange of a water molecule that is bound to the metal ion with water molecules that are free in fluids and tissue. Water molecules are impacted by passing through the local magnetic field produced by the gadolinium ion. And so you have then no direct water coordination. So the first one has to do with water molecules from the body exchanging with the, 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 the ninth site and how they can affect the relaxation of the water from the body. Or if not a direct coordination, you can still have an effect where water molecules come into the vicinity of the gadolinium compound and that local magnetic field produced by the gadolinium is enough to have an impact on the water molecule. So one direct contact and one that's indirect. All right. So... Let's see if we can, if this plays very nicely here, we'll see, have a video. Diagnostic imaging is one of the fastest growing disciplines in the hospital today. Most MRI contrast media contain gadolinium, a paramagnetic metal. Contrast media with a linear molecular structure enclose the gadolinium ion, forming a stable coordination complex with eight bonds. The remaining ninth bond binds a water molecule. Macrocyclic contrast media also form a coordination complex with eight bonds with a gadolinium ion. But unlike the linear media, they completely encircle the gadolinium ion in an even more stable manner, like a cage. In the body, the gadolinium complex is not isolated. It is surrounded by many competitors, such as zinc, competing for the complex, thereby releasing the gadolinium ion. The macrocyclic compound belongs to the class of contrast media with the highest stability, and thereby delivers excellent imaging results by shortening T1 relaxation time more than other contrast media. Yeah, so that gives us a, a visual of how this works, but also shows something really important, why uh, some of these compounds can become toxic, because you can have a release of gadolinium, which can be extremely toxic. All right, so the key thing here is that gadolinium um, three base contrast agents, they pre predominantly affect the T1, so they call it T1 contrast agents. All right, it turns out that there are other metal ions that are also satisfied with the requirement of a high paramagnetism. And so, for instance, you can have small molecules um, that are mang manganese-based. Um, so manganese has high spin D5. You also, as we mentioned in our previous lecture, have spions. Remember, spions are the, the ones that contain iron oxide nanoparticles, so they can be used for this particular application as well. Um, so they're composed, as I mentioned last time, of magnemite iron oxide or magnetite iron oxide. Well, the spin moment, moments of many iron centers align in the same direction. So you're going to get that, that uh, interaction between the, 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 the iron centers and they produce a strong local um, magnetic fields. So they're used as magnetic resonance imaging T2 agents because they tend to impact more the T2 um, as opposed to the T1. So they, they affect the T2 and is a T2 star of water molecules that are passing through the field. So clinically used, so these are some examples. Um, you have the uh, gadolinium-based compounds. You also have another one here, which has a, a functional group. That functional group can bind to human serum albumin, and that's important because you want to possibly extend a little bit of the lifetime of the, the actual agent itself. And here is uh, a, a manganese one that, that is used clinically. All right, so 
Here we're focusing on the um, the manganese ones, not the manganese ones, excuse me. This is the uh, gadolinium one. So this is magnavist. So this is this compound here. So here, what are we looking at is it's used as a contrast agent. So we have a brain tumor that's uh, image using MRI. Uh, and you're, in this context, you're focused on a T1 weighted. If you remember, gadolinium tends to be have an impact on the T1. So here's the scan before and after the patient was administered that gadolinium compound. So the tumor is opaque in the pre-contrast image. So opaque means that you can kind of see it. You kind of see it's a little bit dark, but it's really hard to tell if that really is something, okay? So then, uh, but it appears as a bright mass. It lightens up significantly in the MRI image, MRI image um, in the presence of the gadolinium compound. So that's the value of this. And you can actually very distinctly um, see it because here, this could have been just a, a technical artifact that it looks a little bit dark. All right, so the limitation of these compounds, so as I already mentioned to you, and as you saw in the video, these compounds can dissociate, re releasing these metals that it can be quite toxic. So some gadolinium complexes are not very stable under physiologic conditions and can dissociate. The free equated gadolinium complex, so that's gadolinium surrounded by nine one molecules, is toxic to cells and causes nephrogenic systemic fibrosis, so NSF, so that's stemming scarring of the, the kidney. So the disabling and potentially fatal disorder, it also causes fibrosis in skin, joints, eyes, and um, other internal organs. Um, the manganese, uh, excuse me, yeah, manganese-based MRI conscious agents can result in disconcerting accumulation of the metal ion. Again, in a very similar capacity where you liberate the, the, the manganese, it becomes equated, and it leads to a really high amount of this metal getting localized in the brain, and it can result in a condition called manganism, which has um, debilitating effects that are comparable to Parkinson's disease. Acute exposure of high levels of this metal can lead to hepatic failure and cardiac toxicity. So these are very real problems that are associated with the use of these type of materials. Okay. Uh, you know, um, I'm not sure, but we can. I'm gonna like show you an example. I think I have some dosages there, but you you really need high amounts. So like. For a lot of these experiments, when you're looking at the relaxation, you're talking about millimolar. So millimolar in the body, that means a really high dosage um, to try to even get that level, especially if you're trying to get something that gets into the brain. So I'm, I'm assuming you're, you're getting quite a bit of a, of a dosage of, of, these, of these materials, which is why these are very real problems. Yeah. All right, so the effectiveness of the contrast agent. So measured by a property of the contrast agent called the relaxativity or RI. This parameter um, and the concentration of the concentration affect the water relaxation property. So this is a, a simple equation that um, you basically do your measurements and you try to determine your, your um, relaxation parameters. So either you want to measure the R1 and the T, sorry, T, RI and the TI, which you need to be the one or the two. So this is a global relaxation rate constant of water molecules in the system. And then you can measure the TI and diam, which is the relaxation time of water before the addition of the paramagnetic um, contrast agent. So the typical contrast agent um, concentration that is assessed uh, in the millimolar range, which gives us some ideas to the dosages I'm telling you how to get that people will typically have to take. So you get an output like this, where you, this is essentially a linear equation, right? Where you're gonna get that R and you're gonna plot it against the concentration of your contrast agent. So you get a straight line. And so then the slope of this line will be your RI value. And then the intercept is going to be then this parameter here, T1 over the uh, one over to TI. Okay, so that'd be what information you get from your experimental uh, collection. All right, so we're talking about a work. Uh, this was done with Professor um, Raptus, who was a professor here at, uh, at our university. Uh, he now is at the um, Florida International University. So here, the idea was to use not spions, but they were focusing on an octonuclear iron oxide clusters uh, to enhance conscious and MRI in vitro and in vivo. All right, so what was the objective of the study? So what they wanted to do was to try to take this template. This was an iron containing template. It contains five, eight iron ions. And so I was taking this cluster and see if you can modify it in such a way that you can improve its capability of serving as a conscious agent for MRI. So what did they do? So they took this, this cluster and they conjugated it with 
a 5 kilodalton hyaluronic acid. So if you recall, hyaluronic acid is one of those targeting groups as it has receptors that are overexpressed um, in cancer cells relative to non-cancer cells. And so the way that this, um, this particular uh, conjugate was assessed by using the uh, 57 um, iron mass power and also by using mass spectrometry to get a perception of what it was actually produced. So additional things that were assessed were the relative cytotoxicity of the compound, because the idea in this case is that you want an agent that can image, that can potentially serve as a diagnostic agent, but not necessarily to be cytotoxin. You don't want to harm cells. And then the next thing was to see the potential of it as a T2 contrast agent. All right. So let's look at the that particular cluster. So I zoomed in to try to give us a perspective of what of the irons that are here. So you have um, actually you have two populations of iron in this cluster. One population is in that that cubane. So do you see that cubane that's right here in the center? So that's formed by iron interacting with oxygen. So you have four of the of the irons that are part of that cubane. But then you have um, additional ions that are associated with the oxygens that are part of that cubane. So you have four of these it's here, here, and here. Okay. So they're coordinated to the oxygens of that cubane, but then you have this other ligand, this pyrazole ligand. So I'm just giving you this perspective here, this drawing that's serving as a bridge between different ions. So you get this cluster that, that's, um, that, that it was designed and had promising. Um, capability of serving as a contrast agent. But the thing is that this particular cluster doesn't have anything that would, would make it favorable for targeting um, a particular tumor tissue. So the idea was that you want to modify and you want to take advantage of the, the coordination environment of the irons. So just to go back a bit and erase some of the stuff. When you look really closely at the coordination of the irons, so let's fo focus on the example here. So let's look at this iron here. So that iron is actually coordinated to um, six different um, atoms. So you have coordination to three, let me just show them as stars, three oxygens, okay? And then you have coordination to three nitrogens. So you have satis basically set fully satisfying the coordination around that, that particular iron. But then the other iron that's external to the cubane, for instance, this one right here, is coordination number, is coordination number five. So the idea is that you want to try to take advantage of the, um, the, those particular external irons to try to append these functional groups. So what exactly was, what was the end goal? Well, you want to introduce uh, a targeting group that can help this to be able to be more effective at targeting a particular tumor tissue. So here, the hyaluronic acid was modified by incorporating this tyrosine-like molecule, this moiety, so that essentially then you you're building in this, uh, this group here, this phenol group, that phenol group has really good iron binding properties. So you modify the hyaluronic acid so that you can take advantage of this coronation site to then bind onto the external irons. So the idea was that you want to build up this type of group and it turns out this is a proposed model. This, at the end of the day, this was not 100% know whether or not this was formed. But essentially, you're taking those clusters, you're adding in this group, which brings in the hyaluronic acid, and you're taking advantage of the, um, the external irons in order to then build up this type of more extended cluster. So as an example here, you have the iron-8 um, cluster, and then these oxygens that are associated with it are the oxygens that are becoming affiliated with the, the irons that are external to the cubanes. And that's how you have uh, you're bringing in the um, hyaluronic acid, but you also are you linking between two different iron um, iron eight clusters. Okay, so if you look, if you notice, then we went from here, which had two iron populations, over here we end up with something that has three iron populations. Okay, so how is that happening? Well, we have not modified the cubane of the iron eight. So one set of irons still is part of that cubane, but the external ions, the external to the cubanes, you have some of them that are affiliated with this group here, and then you have some of them that are serving as bridges between the iron eight clusters, okay? 
So that's important because to try to build this model, this is where the 57-line MOSFAR uh, spectrum was used, or spectroscopy was used to make sense of it. So we're not really familiar with this technique, but I just want to show you that this is a nice technique in order to assess not just the iron oxidation state, but also the type of coordination modality that the iron is, is participating in. So this particular technique was gathered and it verified that you do have three distinct population, or in this case, sites, where 50% of them are the iron that's in the cubane, because that's four of the eight irons. And then you have 20% that are associated with the bridging, and then 30% that are associated with the hyaluronic acid that's been modified with the, um, the, uh, the terramine group. All right, so a few different features that were characterized. So one of those is that what happens to this cluster as you modify the pH? So within the physiological range, this cluster remains approximately similar in size. So we don't really see much of a pH dependence here. It's when you start to, to basify this, um, this clustering solution where you start to get a, um, a greater aggregation of the material. So within this physiological range of four to about eight, we have a pretty much a consistent size um, cluster. But then um, in terms of the, the, uh, the zeta potential, so zeta potential gives us a bit of the um, detail of the surface charge. What we see is that here you have somewhat of pH um, dependence in that physiological range, where it becomes more negative, which is indicative of a more of a negative surface. And then as you start to base by it, it becomes more, um, much more negative. All right, so again, there's no crystal structure here. So the, the, what this actual conjugate is, is only obtained by a combination of different techniques to give us some perspective of what this is. So one approach that was taken was to just get the perspective of the compound versus just the free um, terramine ligand or the free terramine hyaluronic acid. So this is a technique called gel filtration chromatography, which can help you to get a perspective of the size of your compound. So the way this particular technique works, you use a column and you're separating things by size. So it's basically size exclusion. So things that are smaller are going to go, they're going to elude um, faster than things that are um, that are bigger. So is that correct? No, excuse me. Things that are, I said it the other way around. Things that are bigger are going to elude faster than things that are smaller because the things that are smaller are going to get, are going to get captured um, through the pores of the column. So there you see then, that you have what is associated with the actual conjugate that's eluding um, earlier than the actual um, small molecule, which is going to get trapped within the pores of the column. And therefore, it takes longer time to actually elude. So you're basically separating this by size. So this gives us a perspective of, of a difference of, of this. But it doesn't, at least by this technique, for this application, it doesn't give you an actual and accurate mass uh, molecular weight. It just tells you a difference in terms of the, um, the dimension. So we did try to see whether or not this um, we can measure the mass of the compound by mass spectrometry, and, and MALDI is something that will give you masses in this range. But we were never able to assess the actual intact compound by MALDI. But one thing that we did note was that we were able to get the, um, the MALDI spectrum of the cluster itself, you know, the iron eight. So that's what that looks like. But at no point um, did we ever perceive this in the actual spectrum of the, the conjugate. So that indicates to us that the actual cluster itself never dissociates. But we do see in the moldy of the cluster um, evidence for dissociation, surface dissociation of the terramine hyaluronic acid um, ligands. So you get the monomer there, you also get a dimer that they can form. So there's some amount of dissociation occurring of the actual um, hyaluronic acid group. Uh, looking at this in water, the compound is fairly stable just in water, so no pH regulation there. But when you look at this at a pH of 7.4, here you see that there's a difference in the stability of the compound. There's not a really nice, the really clearly defined absorbance for this compound. You get more of a shoulder that appears here. And so assessing this over time, well, you see that for a certain, for a certain amount of time, the compound seems to be fairly stable. But what, what I mean there is that the spectrum associated with this compound is, uh, is the same spectrum you get over time. But then after an extended amount of hours, it's so where you start to see the growth of the signal, maybe as a consequence of aggregation or, or some other factor influencing this. But you can see that there is a pronounced increase in the absorbance, and there's also some amount of baseline shift that occurs over time. So that can indicate some aggregation that's occurring and that's affecting the, the profile of this absorbance. So 
Within a certain amount of hours, this compound is fairly stable at a pH of 7.4. So that's important in terms of just understanding the utility of how you're going to administer this compound. So another thing that was assessed, as I was mentioning to you, is the relative cytotoxicity of this compound. Mm -hmm. So you have the, uh, the contrast agent, so this was the actual conjugate versus a negative control, which is albumin, versus a positive control, something that's known to be cytotoxic at a particular concentration. So here it was assessed against two different cell lines, uh, A549 and COS7. And so the idea was to see at the concentration range, at this particular concentration range, what do we assess in terms of the general effect that they have these cell lines? And we don't see a significant amount of an effect um, at, the, at the 30 micromolar level. Okay. But then what about the properties associated with the relax, relaxivity? So here again, we look back um, for using this equation here in order to understand um, the relaxivity, and this was done at different Teslas. So this was done at 1.3, 7.2, and 11.9, and the associated parameters under those different conditions. In addition, where the, the R2 related relaxivity, again, under the three different um, Teslas. And so here we get these, um, these uh, measured values for the, the T1, the T2, and the R1, and the R2. So here's just a, a summary of the data that was collected. So comparing the conjugate versus a commercially available um, compound, this gadolinium um, compound referred to as Optimark. Here we can see the measurements of the, the R1 values, okay, at the different Teslas, and then the measurement of the R2 value at the different Teslas, right? Again, this compound, um, because it's iron base, should be something that would work as a T2 agent, but this is something that's generally assessed to get the full picture of the, the impact that it has on relaxivity. All right, so I, I'm, I skipped one part, um, I probably should have kept it, which is looking at what is called phantom images. Phantom images gives you a perspective of whether or not a compound is actually might have the capacity to serve as a contrast agent. But I'm, I'm, I'm going straight to the, uh, the in vivo studies where that's what they were looking at, does this particular contrast agent work to image a, a tumor that, that was placed within a, a, an animal model. So in a mouse, these MDA MB468, which is a pretty aggressive human breast um, cancer, so these tumors were implanted, they were planted bilaterally in the, uh, in the mammary fat pads. And so what we're looking at here is an image of this part of, of, the, of the mouse and the tumor. So what I wanna note is that this here is just gel, so that we're not really gonna focus on. We're just gonna note, focus on where the actual tumor appeared and what's happening before and after administration of the, of, the, um, of the compound. And so what we're looking at is, this is the top is the before injection and then the bottom is post injection. And so this was done um, as injection intratumorally. So what does that mean, intratumorally? That means at the site of where the tumor is, okay? And so what we see then is by waiting in a T, T2, we can see some amount of, uh, of the actual tumor being detected, but then when you wait it for the T2 star, you see an even more significant enhancement of the tumor that's, that's detected. So then the what other examination done here? So this one, I, myself, I'm, I have some issues with this slide, but anyways, um, here is looking at administration in an intravenous manner. So not intratumorally, but intravenous and in see can that actually reach the site. So at the left, we see pre-injection, um, and at the right, we see post-injection. And so supposedly, you do see that, um, that enhanced contrast. But what I have a problem with is I, I can see that, but it's supposed to be something that's darkening. That's a typical feature of the, the effect of this type of contrast. Agent. So for whatever reason, that's not what's being perceived here, but we, you can see to some extent, although not as clearly, as the intratumoral um, assessment of the use of this material as a contrast agent, which is much more pronounced here than you do see it over here. Okay. All right, so I will leave you with that. Does anyone have any questions, any doubts? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Exactly. So based on, so he's getting 1 profile. So he had this data here. Okay. This is the data that was collected. So based on the profile, so city had this data here. Okay. This is the data that was collected. And so you collect that data and then you use, um, you then try to make sense. And so this technique is quite well defined for iron. 
where you can see whether it's iron two, three, and the types of the coordination, high spin, low spin, and so forth. Then you can figure out by doing what is called a deconvolution. You deconvolute this data and you try to make sense of what are the, the, um, the amounts of contribution from the different types of iron that gives you this full signal. So that one, one of them is the blue, that blue signal that's there, that's one of the, um, how they fit the data for a particular species. And they have the green, which is another another species, and they have the red. So the, um, I believe it's associated with the intensity, you can get the percentage. How much is associated with what type of um, iron species, how much is associated with another. And so in this case, they were able to perceive, and they fit the data quite nicely, because you see a nice overlap between experimental, which are the dots, and the, um, the, the, the fit, which is the straight lines, that you, you, you match it pretty spot on for something that suggests you have 50% of iron of this nature, 20% and 30%. So more specifically then, if you go back to, this is what was used to try to make sense of a model like this, where the 50%, if you're focusing on just each iron cluster, the 50% will always be come from the iron that are in the cubane part where then the, the 20 and the 30% are coming from the distribution of these external ions and how they're affiliated with either the tyramine or the link of the bridging between the units. So that's how they were able to use that technique to get some sense of how this is actually um, associated as a model because in the absence of any, any structural data, excuse me, any structural data from like crystal life. So mass power, not so much. I think there's maybe a, a, one other metal where this technique is, this, this technique is basically mostly for just iron. So it's quite useful. I myself have not ever used them myself, but this is part of a collaboration where they were, they were able to, to get this data. Other questions, doubts? Yeah. Are you able to say, uh, sorry, they still haven't figured out the structure? No, nothing, nothing to, and in fact, I, I'm going to the video. Let's, uh,